Okay, thank you, Caroline. Um, can everyone hear me? Can everyone see me okay? Just sort of tick a yes or say yes, please. Okay, uh, well, thank you very much for coming. I should introduce myself first of all. Uh, my name is Philip, Philip Kerr. Um, I'm a teacher trainer, a lecturer, and I'm a course book writer. And if you come across me, it's in one of those contexts. The most well-known books that I've written are Inside Out and the new Inside Out series. Uh, the series Straightforward, and there's a second edition of Straightforward uh, quite recently, and the series which I wrote for Poland called Matura Masters. So that's, that's my background. Um, I'm sitting in the office in Oxford, a beautiful, cold, but sunny day. Uh, although I came over here from Brussels, which is where I normally live. I'm kind of half living in Brussels and half living in Vienna at the moment. The, the subject of, of this webinar today is uh, translation. And uh, there's only so much that I can cover in a relatively short time. So the good news uh, for you, first of all, is that there is a handout which goes with this, which is a digital handout. And you can access this afterwards um, on the address that you can see on the screen. Um, this, it, it, it's, it's in the form of a blog, but it isn't really a blog because it's not intended to be interactive. But I would be very, very pleased to hear from anyone who has uh, practical ideas or arguments which say they want to raise. Uh, you can raise them on, on that blog handout there. It contains far, far more practical ideas than I can possibly get through in 45, 50 minutes. So uh, that's the address, and I'll give it to you again uh, later on. But you can always, of course, run through this uh, and watch this in video um, asynchronously some other time. Um, I should say as well before I begin that although this is about translation, I'm not in any way advocating a return to the bad old days of translation where a teacher will give out a short literary text and then go around the class with one student after the other saying, you translate this bit and you translate that bit. I'm not talking about that at all. Um, I'm talking about perhaps a more up-to-date and contemporary way of using the student's mother tongue in the classroom. I should also say that when I talk about translation, my understanding of translation is broad. And by translation, I mean also any use of the student's mother tongue in the classroom. Um, and the activities, which I'm going to suggest, uh, most of this webinar will be devoted to practical activities. The activities are intended for classes where the students share the same language. It's not necessarily their mother tongue, because there are plenty of contexts where students uh, share the same language, but it's not their mother tongue. Um, but I'm not really talking uh, today about uh, classrooms where you've got students of 10, 15 different language backgrounds. There is, I think, a role for uh, using the student's mother tongue in those contexts. For example, in language schools in the UK or language schools in uh, the US. But I'm not really going to address those issues now. The whole uh, business of translation in language teaching has been taboo for many years. When I qualified as a teacher, it was expected that I would use English and only English. Um, in my whole 25, 30 years now of language teaching, the mother tongue is almost never talked about. And if you look at a teacher training manual uh, for any age group and you look for translation in the index, you almost certainly won't find it. It's changing a little bit now, but only very, very slowly. So it's, it's been kind of ignored. And I've done this uh, version of this presentation many times now in the last 12 months. And very often, people have come up to me at the end and said, uh, thank you for that. I don't have to feel guilty any longer about using my own language and the student's own language. But I'm not talking about going back to the, the boring old days of going around the classroom asking students to translate a sentence. The whole issue of mother tongue use in a foreign language classroom has become much more topical recently. In uh, 2010, two years ago, Guy Cook brought out a book called Translation in Language Teaching. And this was uh, an, a prize-winning book, an award-winning book, and it has already been extraordinarily influential. And in the introduction to this book, Guy says, translating should be a major aim and means of language learning and a major measure of success. This argument is a major break with tradition. Well, I'm going to sort of disagree with Guy slightly because when he says the argument is a major break with tradition, he's only partly right. There are parts of the world, and there are some institutions in all countries where the mother tongue is banned. 
I have friends who've worked in language schools in Spain, one example I can think of. Uh, the friend in uh, question was French, and she got a job teaching English in a language school, but she had to pretend to be English, and English only, never any Spanish allowed. And when I worked, I won't name the school, school in Brussels, I was told that if I used either French or Flemish in the classroom, I would be fired immediately. And this is still the case. Um, many uh, institutions in the Gulf, the Arab Gulf, for example, ban the use of mother tongue. But is it really a major break with tradition? I don't think so. And I've been looking through the literature. And when you start looking back in the literature, the academic research literature, you'll find it very, very difficult to come across anyone who argues that we should only ever use English. Um, a sample list of names, but I will be handing out uh, shortly a, a long bibliography which you can check. But a sample list of names of the, the kinds of people who've been saying we should be considering using the student's first language from time to time. Um, Henry Widdison in 2003, but he's been saying this for quite a long time. Uh, Vivian Cook, perhaps one of the most well-known second language acquisition uh, researchers in 2001. Uh, Costas Gabrielatis in 1998, Mario Rinvalucri in 1900, and perhaps you wouldn't expect someone like Mario Rinvalucri um, to be advocating the use of the mother tongue, but he does, and he does it very forcefully. Going further back, Julian Edge in 1987, Ian Tudor in 1986, Rod Belitho in 1983, and we can keep going back, way, way back to the 1960s. In actual fact, there is a consensus about this. There is not one single academic, to my knowledge, who says we should never use English, oh, sorry, we should never use the mother tongue in an English language classroom. There is considerable research, and I'll refer to some of this, um, and there is now a consensus. What's slightly strange is that the consensus, the academic and research consensus, has not uh, trickled down, it's not come down to the practical level, and teachers are generally, and teacher trainers too, are generally unaware um, that in certain circumstances and for certain reasons, using the mother tongue is not only acceptable, but a very, very good idea. So, translation is back on the agenda. There are more people talking about it now. I went to a conference in um, the Czech Republic recently where Hugh Della was speaking and he was talking about uh, the use of mother tongue. But almost everybody is now beginning to acknowledge, yes, there is a place for it. I'm going to talk just very briefly because I want to devote most of the time to practical suggestions and to get you to do one or two things. But I want to talk just briefly about uh, some of the reasons why people are suggesting that we should be bringing uh, the mother tongue back in in a principled way. Okay, now I've divided these reasons uh, into six. Uh, the first of these is cognitive, and it's probably the most powerful. Uh, the, the argument here, I don't want to go into detail, but the argument is really very simple. Any kind of learning, including language learning, must be built on previous learning. It must be scaffolded on something else. We don't learn anything in a vacuum. For a language learner, especially a, a beginner, a very low-level language learner, they don't bring any knowledge of English to the classroom, or very little. But what they do bring to the classroom is a very considerable amount of knowledge about their own language, and possibly other languages which they've already learned. So it's not only desirable but necessary that they will scaffold their learning of English on their knowledge of other languages. Even if you try to ban translation or the use of mother tongue in the classroom, your students are going to be doing it. They're going to be doing it in their heads, and they're going to be doing it uh, among themselves. Um, my teenage daughter who's studying, she, her first language is French. My teenage daughter studying in Brussels um, is not allowed to use French in the classroom, but as soon as the teacher is not paying attention, the kids are all talking English among themselves. So it's going to happen whether we like it or not. Uh, it makes sense cognitively, and therefore perhaps we should think about using it in a principled way rather than just letting it happen when we'd like to ban it. So the first reason is then a cognitive. The, the second main category of reasons is intercultural. If we're teaching students language, there are a number of reasons why they're learning languages. One may be because they need to be proficient in English in order to pass an exam or, or get a job or something like that. But more broadly speaking, the reasons why we teach languages in schools and universities is to develop an awareness of other cultures. 
and the intercultural role of language learning and language teaching is central uh, in all of the documents from the um, the Council of Europe, things like the Common European Framework of Reference. The point of language learning, as far as the Council of Europe is concerned, is to develop intercultural understanding. Well, culture is expressed through language, and it is uh, mediating. Language mediates this culture. If we uh, want to explore the differences between cultures, then we can't really do it without looking at the language which the culture is expressed through. Translation will be a necessary part of uh, any kind of intercultural training. And the kinds of uh, language items, words which can't easily be translated, are precisely those which we should be exploring through translation to develop an intercultural awareness or to develop intercultural understanding. OK, broad, broadly speaking, then intercultural reasons. The, the next category of reason is uh, what I call humanist. And by this, I mean that there is, um, I think there's a general understanding nowadays that when we are in a classroom, we want our students to express personal meanings. They, we want them to uh, express their personal identities. Well, we must then ask ourselves, how do our students define their personal identities? Many of us, although I'm not one, define ourselves very centrally in terms of the language that we speak. In some parts of the world, such as Brussels, where I live, if you ask people um, what their nationality is, they're more likely, they may well say Belgian, but they're more likely to say, I'm a French speaker or I'm a Flemish speaker. The language is central, and this is clearly true in so many other countries. If you see your identity is centrally concerned with your language, but your teacher bans your own language from the classroom, in a sense, the teacher is banning the expression of a certain part of your personality. And that is not exactly the most humanistic approach. There's a second strand to uh, humanistic approaches, and that is this. If we want our students to express personal meanings, they can only do so if they've got enough English to express that. But at very low levels, they won't have this uh, linguistic knowledge. And does this mean, therefore, that we can't get them to express personal meanings? I think not. I think that we can ask them to express their personal meanings in their mother tongue, and then we can help them to express those ideas in English. We can work from the mother tongue to uh, the target language, English, saying things which are very personal from the start, the beginning of a, a course. Uh, I move quite rapidly through the, the next uh, few categories. The, the next one is technical. Uh, we're living in a digital age. Most of our students are now digital natives. They know uh, where to go on the internet to get help. And if they're learning languages, they will almost all, without any doubt at all, they will all know Google Translate. When I say to teenagers, do you know Google Translate? They say, well, of course we know Google Translate. We use it all of the time. And because of the, because, because Google Translate is now everywhere, we don't really need to use proper translation skills, we do know, we do need to know how to use Google Translate. And although our students may know how to get hold of Google Translate, how to cut and paste the text into it, they typically don't know about its limitations. And nor, uh, unfortunately, do many other people. The number of bad translations you see around the world uh, because people have used Google Translate. So I think we should be teaching our students to use the translation tools. There are other uh, technological developments um, which I think lend themselves to exploitation in the classroom. I'll talk a little bit about using video. I'll talk about one or two uh, software programs which uh, are quite helpful. Uh, practical reasons. This is perhaps what everybody already knows. Um, when we ask teachers, when researchers ask teachers how often they use the mother tongue in the classroom, uh, they tend to underestimate the actual amount. If they say they use it 30% of the time, it's probably more like 45 or 50% of the time. They underestimated perhaps for reasons of guilt, but we're not sure why. But there are clearly practical reasons why we will use the mother tongue. Um, one is, for example, to deal with uh, administrative issues which we can't deal with in English because the students don't have the language. But there is also another very obvious moment when we will use the mother tongue, and that is to save time. There's not a lot of point uh, spending let's say five or ten minutes, trying to explain a, a very basic word in English through English when a simple translation will work 
better. So for simple practical reasons which we're all aware of, uh, the mother tongue may make sense. The final reason, the epistemological reason, is, is an interesting one. By epistemological I'm referring to who owns the language of English language teaching, who owns the discourse of the teachers' books, the conference uh, proceedings, the journals, the magazines, and so on. When I began teaching uh, 25, 30 years ago, all of the books were written by native speakers. And these native speakers were based either in the UK, the US, Australia sometimes. And their experience of language teaching was, was typically working with multilingual groups, uh, typically adults as well rather than children, and often in rather privileged environments with 12 or 10 or 15 students in a class. In those kinds of contexts, it was normal that the, the writers would talk about their own experience which meant that the mother tongue wasn't really possible. But for the vast majority of teachers around the world, they don't have English as a mother tongue. They teach in large classes, and the students are not necessarily terribly motivated. So we've seen, or we're seeing now, a gradual shift in uh, research and in the journals, the magazines, and the conferences away from the more elite world of private language schools and the native speaker, and more towards the experience of what I call normal teaching, working with larger classes in state institutions. And because we're moving much more towards this kind of world, it's normal that uh, the role of the mother tongue is becoming much, much more important. So there's this epistemological shift taking place. Uh, you see it in the positions of importance and power. The president of IATEFL was, I think it was two years ago, was Herbert Buchter, an Austrian. Uh, this, was, this was unthinkable. 10, 15, 20 years ago. The course books now increasingly are being written by people who know uh, the local contexts. One of my books, Metro Masters for Poland, uh, I wrote with Marta Rozinska, um, because clearly she knows much more about Polish schools than, than I possibly could. So we've got this shift too. To summarize all of that, I, I would say that there is um, a consensus. Nobody in the world of academia and research is now suggesting that we should ban the mother tongue from the classroom. The question is not if or whether we should use it, but how often and, and why. So for the rest of the time that I've got available, I want to look at some practical suggestions. Uh, the first of these is a technique called reverse translation. And some of you, I'm sure, perhaps even many of you, uh, use reverse translation as a technique in the classroom. It's sometimes called back translation as well. It's, there's nothing new about it. Um, the first reference that I've come across to it is 16th century. And the print that you can see, there's a woodcut that you can see on the screen, is from a 16th century book uh, called The Schoolmaster by Roger Ascham. And Ascham was an English educationalist who taught uh, some of the, the English princesses, Elizabeth and Mary. And he recommends this technique of reverse translation. But I then discovered uh, that he actually stole the idea, uh, probably from Juan Luis Vives, the, the Spanish humanist, earlier in the century, he was also recommending it. And the technique of reverse translation is very, very simple. And I'll, I'll demonstrate it with you. I hope it'll work um, soon. Basically, it involves taking a short amount of text in one language, let's say English, we then translate this text into the student's own language. We've got a new text now, a Spanish language text. And then at some subsequent date, or moment, we translate the Spanish text back into English. So we go from English to Spanish, Spanish back to English. Or it could be starting with Spanish, going from Spanish to English, and then English back to Spanish. And this means that we can compare uh, the two versions that are in the same language. In the classroom, how will this work? Well, I want to um, suggest uh, two or three uh, ideas here. Um, but there will be a handout which will send uh, towards the end, where I think I've written about five or six reverse translation techniques. Guy Cook suggests that reverse translation is perhaps the most valuable tool that any teacher, any language teacher, could possibly have. Um, one simple way, then, of using it, and this is as a, as a warmer for a classroom. And this could be done with any, uh, any level any age group. Uh, begin by whispering uh, a small, short piece of language to one of the students in the class. With lower levels, it'll have to be very, very short. You whisper this in English to one of the students in the class. 
the student then translates the, uh, the language into their mother tongue and they whisper the translation into the ear of the person sitting nearest to them. So let's say we've started in English, I've whispered in English to the first student, she will translate it into Spanish and whisper it to the person next to her. The person next to her, hearing some Spanish, will then translate this back into English and whisper it on to the student next to her. And the, the piece of language is passed on in this way from student to student in much the same way as we do in, a, in an activity like what's it called, um, Chinese whispers, the British call it, uh, and there's another, there's another term which is used, oh, broken telephone, I think is the more common term in the US. So a simple little warmer will work quite well. It's quite rich and it's quite entertaining. Another way of, <coughs> excuse me, another way of doing this is uh, in, in, in writing. So if the students start with, let's say, a little blank piece of paper, they write uh, a short sentence at the top of the paper here, they pass the paper onto a partner. The partner translates this sentence into the other language. They then fold over the piece of paper so that the original can't be seen. And then they again pass this on to another student who translates it back into another language. So we can keep on doing this, folding the paper over, bending it, and passing it along. Um, again, this is quite fun as a, as a warmer, as a fun activity, or as a filler. But the kind of language which you might work with would probably be uh, the language which you're teaching. If you're teaching a particular area of grammar or some vocabulary, you could do it um, in this way. A couple of other uh, very concrete suggestions, though, and I'd like to see if we can do this a little bit more interactively. Um, I'd like you to imagine the situation which probably happens in, in almost every single class or every other class when you're teaching, um, let's say, a bit of grammar or a little bit of vocabulary. And there's a very strong possibility that you're going to be using a gap fill. And the reason why you may be using a gap fill is because the books are full of them. So you might, for example, have an activity like this. Now, this uh, particular activity, um, which I'm going to hide from you in a second, um, is to practice the difference between house and home. It's a low level, a B1 level thing. It's a gap fill using house and home. OK, I'm going back to hide it. Now, I'd like you to imagine that uh, your students have done this um, activity. You've gone through it in class. You've checked the answers. And you're probably going to move on and do something else. Well, here's another suggestion. Instead of moving on and doing something else, here's a way of using gap fills, which makes them a little bit more interesting. Uh, tell your students to close the book so they can't see the exercise anymore. And tell them to get out a piece of paper and a pencil or a pen. And you're going to dictate some sentences. So I'm going to dictate one or two of these sentences to you. If you're ready, I hope you're ready. Got a piece of uh, paper and a pencil? I hope. And as I dictate them, I need to take my glasses off to read. As I dictate them, do not write them in English. Just write them immediately in your own language or into another language, OK? So if you're Russian, you can just write the Russian and not the English. We'll do this quite quickly if we can. Just scribble them down. Number one. What is your hometown like? What is your hometown like? Just write it down in your mother tongue. Number two. At what age do people usually leave home in your country? At what age do people usually leave home in your country? Number three. How do you feel when you are away from home? How do you feel when you are away from home? And I'll do one more. Number four. Is your mother a housewife or does she have another job? Is your mother a housewife or does she have another job? OK, well, I hope you haven't cheated and, and written down any of this in English. Uh, you should have in front of you four sentences written down in your mother tongue. Now what I'd like you to do, and I'd like you to do this in the chat box, or at least some of you perhaps will overload it if too many people do it, but some of you certainly. Could you now translate these uh, sentences back into English? You probably can't remember what all of them were because too much time has passed, but translate them back into English and start entering them into the chat. Let's see what we get. Don't worry if you make mistakes.
Okay, thanks to everyone who's doing this. I'm just having a look at some of the translations. It's quite interesting. Okay, great. If you're, if you're typing, uh, just finish the sentence and don't do any more, that's probably enough to illustrate. If you, like me, scroll through these, you'll see there's some quite interesting things there. Um, putting people under pressure, of course, means that there are going to be some mistakes. That's normal. They're going to be little spelling mistakes. I noticed, for example, that uh, somebody wrote uh, leave with an I, not with an EA. Well, that's normal and that happens all of the time. But what's interesting about this, of course, is once the students have uh, done this kind of work, then you can tell them, well, open your books again and compare your translations from your mother tongue with the originals. And it's one of these activities which is, I think, really interesting because the, the students don't need to be told to do anything. They will automatically want to compare what they've got with what the original was. And then they will start asking questions, you know, is this OK, is that OK? And this is the point when you can begin to explore um, some of the problems and difficulties they're having. Also, of course, by doing it in this way, you're going to enhance any kind of uh, memorization. They're going to remember this language much better because they've done much, much more with it. Um, having also thought about the language, we're encouraging them to, to notice the, the salient features of the language. When we now move on to the next uh, stage of this activity, uh, they're going to be paying much more attention to the language. And with this particular activity, the obvious follow-up, is to put students in pairs, and uh, in pairs they ask and answer these questions. So here's what I'm suggesting is, is a very simple way of, of dealing with of gap fills using translation as a way of, um, so I'm just reading one of the comments here, as a way of encouraging students to notice the English. Someone's asking me the question, should I show the translation before or after? I mean, it's, it's important that it's very important that you should not, they should not see the original when they're doing the translation. And it's important that they're, um, let me get my thoughts right. It's, it's important that they're translating from their own text back into English and only compare afterwards. How you manage the activity in detail um, is really up to you. Um, I think it makes a lot more sense for the students to do uh, things collaboratively because when they're working together, there's a lot more, um, there's a lot more talking about the language, a lot more noticing going on. Up, up to you, really. I mean, you can, you can play around with it in different ways. I use this particularly for, for grammar and vocabulary, uh, but there are other ways of doing something which is very similar. Um, it's, it's strange, because I'm a course book writer, but I, I strongly believe, I think like many writers, that a lot of the good ideas we can't actually put into course books. And the reason why we can't put things into course books is because they don't suit the rubric or the publishers don't like it or something like that. Uh, we often rattle through material too fast. And I think that as teachers, we're often under pressure to move on to the next page. But here's another idea. This is an example of a small text. This is, again, from one of my books. This is a B2 level, uh, but it could be any text. You don't even need to read it at the moment. Don't, don't read it. It's just an example text. But I'd like you to imagine that the students uh, have studied this text in the class with you. They've probably done some reading comprehension questions. They've probably done uh, some grammar or vocabulary work, which follows on from it. And then 50 minutes or an hour or an hour and a half later, you get to the end of the lesson, and students close their books, and that's forgotten. And then the next lesson, you move on to something else. Well, my suggestion is this. Save five or 10 minutes at the end of the lesson. Take a small part of this text, a very small part of this text, and with a B2 level, this would be about right. Yeah, sorry, someone's asking, is this recorded? Yes, everything is recorded. Uh, so you can go back and look, and you can look on the blog. So where was I? Yeah, so at the end of the lesson, give five or 10 minutes, put students into pairs, tell them to translate a small section of this text. And I think this is about the right length for this level B2 in about 10 minutes. And they can do it together. There's nothing, uh, there's, there's nothing competitive about this. When they've done their translations on a piece of paper, take in the paper, and then they can go and leave the class. In a subsequent lesson, maybe the next lesson, maybe a week later, hand their translations back to them, the translations of this text. 
so it'll be in their mother tongue. Again, put them in pairs, maybe the same pair, maybe, maybe, it doesn't matter, different pairs, and ask them to try to translate it back into English. Now, this is much harder, and it's much more challenging. Make it collaborative, and give them 10 minutes or 15 minutes to do this. Of course, when they're doing it, they will want to cheat. You need to tell them that they can't look at their books, keep the books closed. But once they've done it, then again, uh, allow them to look back at the original in the course book. And again, they won't need instructions. They will be motivated to find out how well they did, what they got right, what they got wrong. And we learn best from, um, we learn best from the mistakes that we make. It's good that they make mistakes. The more, the better in some ways uh, they'll really learn from it. Uh, another variation of this idea, which I really like for examination classes, was suggested by um, a colleague of mine, Roger Marshall, in Barcelona. And he says um, his idea is that one way of doing this for exam classes is for the written part of an exam. So in something like, I don't know, the first certificate or proficiency, these kinds of written exams, you have to write a, a short text or maybe a long text of a particular genre. So it might be a letter. Maybe it's, um, maybe it's a curriculum vitae, a resume. Maybe it's a letter of, a, no, I mean, an article, a forum against article, something like that. Well, they're going to have to write one of these things in the exam. So find a model answer, a model text for them. If you're using an exam course book, you'll probably find there's a model text in the course book, the sort of thing they should reproduce. Um, if you haven't got one in the course book, for many of the main major international exams, you'll get uh, model answers on the websites of the exam boards. So get the model text. Translate it yourself into uh, the student's other tongue. OK? All right, so in the classroom, you're going to be working with the English model text. You'll analyze the text. You'll look at the paragraph organization, the way the ideas are structured. You'll be looking at uh, useful phrases, ways of introducing uh, paragraphs, maybe if it's a letter, ways of uh, introducing the topic, maybe ways of signing off. You'll study the, the text in the classroom with the students. When you've got to the end of this natural process of studying the text in the classroom, tell them again to turn over the text so they can't see it or to put it away, and hand out your text which has been translated into their mother tongue. And again, their task is to translate it back into English as best as they can. They go through this process uh, until they can get no further. And then, again, you ask them to look at the original text. And they'll compare their translation with the original. What I like about this, again, is that, um, first of all, it encourages them to notice language in, in a much more attentive way than normally. I mean, getting students to pay attention is the hardest part of our jobs. But what I also like about this is because they're very involved, is that it will facilitate their memorization of the text. So they'll learn uh, the, the key phrases, the useful phrases. OK, so those are some ideas for reverse translation. There are a few more. Um, Caroline, if, if you could, perhaps you could send out, I don't know if we're gonna, how we're doing this technically, but if you could send out, send out the handouts with more ideas on reverse translation, that would be a good time to do this now. OK? If that doesn't happen, we'll, we'll sort it out later. OK, time to move on. Um, I'm taking three broad areas. Reverse translation is, is the first of them. The second big area that I'd like to take is, um, the big area I'd like to take, is what I call uh, assisted translation. Um, by assisted, by, no, sorry, I'm just a problem on my screen. By assisted translation, I mean that we uh, give the students some of the words uh, which they're going to need in order to translate something. And I want to, um, I want to illustrate this with Latin. I'm sure that some of you speak fantastic Latin. If, if you look at the three sentences on the screen, these are proverbs, if you try to translate this without knowing any Latin, you may find it rather difficult. However, because you speak English, you'll recognize some of these words as cognates of English words. Repetitio, repetitio is almost certainly going to mean repetition. Um, studiorum is almost certainly something to do with studies. You, you can make those guesses, I imagine. If you speak Italian or Spanish or Portuguese or French, uh, you'll also recognize other words, words like est. Um, in the first sentence there, meaning is, third person singular of to be. And there may be others too. However, what I'm interested in with uh, assisted translation is 
I don't want my students to spend a lot of time looking up words in the dictionary in the classroom. They flip through a dictionary, they look up words, or they're doing it uh, through a handheld app or, or an online dictionary. But the minute they look up words, they simply forget them. What I'm interested in is trying to encourage them to, to work out what's going on with the language. And one way of doing this is by giving them a little bit of help. I think in the first example here, the one uh, beginning repetitio, you probably don't need much help. You can begin to guess what it means. But with the second one, uh, you may have absolutely no idea what it means because you don't recognize the second word. However, if I tell you that the word D-O-C-E-T is part of the verb teach, Or does it? I've forgotten what it does mean. No, it means learn, doesn't it? Um, if I tell you what some of the words mean, but this means learn, and then the word in the next one, discimus, discimus, I don't know how you pronounce it in Latin, uh, means teach. I may have got it the wrong way around. You can begin to work out uh, what these things mean. So with vocabulary clues, you can now begin to get to grips with the grammar. Would anybody like to have a, a go at what uh, these things actually mean in English? Even if you don't know any Latin, you can begin to work it out. Type in your suggestions. A few have come up already. Experience is the best teacher. We've had, uh, what else have we got here so far? A few other things which are very similar. Type in any good ideas, any better ideas. Experience is the best teacher. Experience teaches, learn from experience. Repetition is a mother of studying. That's quite an interesting, repetition is a mother of studying. I mean, that's a, a literal translation of it. Um, although I don't think that would ever be said in English. The best translation, in my view, of the first one is practice makes perfect. Ah, somebody's got it here. Well done. Congratulations. Who is that? Harriet, practice makes perfect. But my general point here is that if we give students a little bit of vocabulary help, save them looking up in dictionaries, they can engage in the language much, much more. So when it comes to reading texts in the classroom, and I'll go back to the example that I had before, um, we perhaps sometimes say to our students, well, look, don't worry about understanding every word. If you don't know every word, it doesn't matter. Just try to get the general gist. I don't honestly think this makes a lot of sense. Our students are in the classroom to learn English, and their interest is not in the words they know already. They're interested in the words they don't know. So it's totally natural that they would want to know the words they don't know. And they're going to be looking up in a dictionary if you don't try to stop them. I think that it makes enormous sense, and there's a lot of research which backs this up now, that we should be providing them with glossaries. You could provide uh, an English glossary, although I don't see any particular, anything particular to be gained. In the example here, I'm using German as an example. The first uh, word which I anticipate people not knowing at this level, a string of, um, it doesn't mean a string in the literal sense. Um, it means a number of different things. So I've used the German verschieden or mehrere. Um, but we're helping them here deal with the text as a whole. So using uh, glossaries is something which is increasingly valuable. If you don't have the glossary in the book, which is unlikely, you can begin uh, a lesson simply by saying to the students, look, there's a few words you won't understand. Um, look at line four, a string, give them the translation. Look at line eight, yielded, and it means gezeigt in this context. Give them the, uh, the translations, and then they can do the reading. If you want to involve them a little bit more, then um, this is not difficult to do either. So we can take the same little text as, as an example. And here, they're looking at the text, but this time I don't give them the translations. What I do in my planning of the lesson is I look at the text and I anticipate the things which I think they're going to have problems with. And I think that there are four items here which my upper intermediate B2 students will have problems with. And I'll write on the board, the blackboard or the whiteboard, the translations of these words they're going to find difficult. But I won't tell them which words in the text these translations correspond to. So they've got the help but they don't know exactly what these words match up with. OK? Simple idea, really quite fun. All right, I see my time is running out, so I'm going to zoom on and move on to my next category, which I've called Lost in Translation. Uh, there is a huge amount of bad English around the world, and I think that we can make use of it. Some time ago, I came across this menu. So if anyone speaks Spanish, they'll understand 
why, I, or even Portuguese, I should think, why I found this menu so interesting. <coughs> Excuse me. What I'm interested in here is the fact that it is such a bad translation. Now, this is a, this is a literal translation, which to anyone who speaks English is, is really very funny. The, the one in the middle of the list there, rooster fried pedro with tender garlic, census peppers and potatoes to the poor thing. Um, you wonder what on earth it is you're going to be eating. If, however, uh, the uh, students are Spanish speakers, their mother tongue is Spanish, they will be able to understand very, very quickly how this English has, has come about, where it's actually come from. So this is precisely the sort of text which makes sense to work with students who have Spanish as a mother tongue, looking at things which have been badly translated to show them the, the problems and the limitations of literal translation. We want to get them away from that literal translation, thinking about the best ways to express language, and this is one way of doing it. Um, there are quite a lot of examples of this kind of language online. Um, you should be able to find it quite easily, and on the handout, you'll find more examples. But I'd just like to show you one which I find particularly entertaining. Um, and this is from an ex a website called English Funny. So we have a Hungarian word, I think the pronunciation is Lekvarosbuchte, translated into German as Marmeladebuchtel, and then the English is the marvelous fuck up with marmalade. So again, we can use this as a, as a tool to get in. Just before I go on, um, I see that there's a quite an interesting question from Patricia. If students are also learning a second foreign language, is it, a, is it good to have them use it as well? Um, I think the answer to that is simply yes. Um, the more linguistic resources that we can bring in, uh, the more powerful they can be. I've learned uh, very much, I'm trying to learn German at the moment, and the knowledge that I have of Dutch is helping me massively learn German. Uh, yes, those languages will enrich each other. Okay, this is a, a fun example of things that are lost in translation, um, but you wouldn't always want to use material of this kind, clearly. There is, however, one uh, online resource for um, bad translations, which you probably will want to turn to regularly, and that is Google Translate. Google Translate is available, but I don't know how many languages now. The quality of the translations varies enormously from one to the other. Um, English to French, for example, or French to English works quite well, since French and English are really very similar. The word order issues are very much the same. But if your students don't have a language which is very close to English, like French, then Google Translate is going to be much more problematic. I think that uh, the English-French translations on this are accurate about 65-70%. But if you go to another language, German, for example, then it goes down to about 40%. And if you're using a language like Russian or, or Thai or something like that, then it will be even worse. But what's interesting about Google Translate is that the mistakes that it makes are, on the whole, the sorts of um, mistakes that your students are likely to make. So, uh, what I'm suggesting, again, is to use texts that you would ordinarily be studying in class, maybe a, a text from the course book or, or, or part of another text that they're reading, and you get your students to study it through Google Translate and possibly do a reverse translation. As an example, here's a little text. This is a text of mine from one of the course books. Okay, so this is, uh, this is in good English, or at least it should be, because it's mine. If you flick through that. And I then, first of all, I put this into German. Now, if there are any German speakers here, they'll see just how bad this translation is. But what would be the kind of procedure in class would be to give the students the parallel texts. We give them the original English text, we give them the, uh, the Google Translate version, and we underline or we tell them to underline the problems that there are in the text. And they begin to work out with dictionaries or whatever other resources where the problems are. In this particular version, the German version, I think, although my German is not very good, as I've told you, I think the first sentence is actually okay. Um, but the beginning of the second sentence, auf den ersten, um, is not at all what uh, a German would say, auf den ersten Blick, or something like that. But not auf den ersten, because this has been literally translated from the English at first. 
So we give them a translation, highlight where it's problematic, and get them to work on the translation trying to improve it. And they can use any resources available to them. Uh, somebody suggested Suest instead of Afghanest, and that would certainly be better. So we can work from their mother tongue where things are underlined and they, and they look at the, um, the corrections and work at them. Or we can do something slightly more entertaining, and that's we can take uh, the text which has been translated into their mother tongue, and then we translate it back into English again using Google Translate. So the next one I'm going to show you is uh, using Russian. So my original text I translated into Russian um, using Google Translate. I then took the Google Translate version in Russian, stuck it back in the software, and translated it back into English. Now again, what I'm suggesting is we use this as a way of training our students to use online translation much, much better. The kinds of mistakes there are fairly obvious. I mean, the first thing that you notice, everyone will notice, is that there's no article. And that's because when you translate from English into Russian, you're necessarily going to lose the articles. And when Google Translate goes back the other way, it doesn't reinstate the articles, or very few of them anyway. Um, you'll also you lose little verbs like are and is. So this looks to me very much like the kind of, not exactly the same, but the kind of problem that uh, Russian learners of English may have. And it seems sensible to use this simply because it's the sorts of problems which we need to train them to recognize. So using Google Translate um, is uh, a very rich tool. And I, and I think I think our students really need it. Beyond our training as, of our students as language teachers, if we have an educational role, we need to teach them a little bit better how to use this technology, which they tend to use um, so badly. All right, before my time runs out, my, my final category, uh, and I'm talking about uh, technological things. I mean, Google Translate is clearly one example of technology. Um, and here I want to look just briefly at video. Um, there are, uh, well, I remember as, as a child learning languages being given text to translate, uh, which were incredibly tedious. I never understood them. I never had any interest. Extracts from French novels that I would never want to read and I have never read since. But our students will have some interests, and they'll have some in common. One is likely to be pop music. Uh, others could be videos uh, of sports events or entertainment events. And so this is an example of some, uh, some work that some students in Belgium have been doing, some French-speaking Belgian students, where they've been, this is a, a video, I think it's Rihanna, and I'm not very good on pop music. And uh, they are taking a, a, YouTube, a clip, a video clip off YouTube. If they can find one with the English subtitles already, um, they can use that. But if they can't find one with the English subtitles, the first job that they will have will be to find a transcription of the song lyrics. So in this case, we've got these interesting lyrics, well, not so interesting lyrics. I could have been a princess, you'd be a king. And they then work collaboratively and translate it into their mother tongue. Now, what's fun about this is that there is software, and um, I'll give you a, a link in a second, but you can find it in the handout on the blog. There's software which is very, very easy to use, which enables you or your students to do your own subtitling on YouTube video clips. This means that your students are doing work which is real. They're, they're actually translating it or putting these, these subtitles in. They've got to think carefully about the language because it has to be very limited in length. There's only so many words that you can get onto the screen. They're working hard with the language. They tend to be motivated to do it. But the payoff comes when they then upload it themselves on back onto YouTube or, or a site like YouTube. And they are the first person in the world to put up a subtitled version in their own language of the latest pop song. And teenagers particularly, but even adults, um, respond so positively when they see that a week later they had 2,000, 5,000, 8,000 hits of people who've gone to this video that they've created. So using this uh, video clips with subtitling technology um, is one way that uh, we found of, of providing quite high levels of motivation. If, like me, you're not very good uh, technologically, don't worry. There's, uh, somebody asks about copyright. Yes, I shouldn't really be recommending this because there is a copyright issue. Don't do it. It's totally illegal. Sorry. Um, but you will find some clips which, um, which are copyright free. 
And there are a couple of links here. Uh, the first one, uh, levis.cti.gr. I think that levis, if I remember right, is learning English via subtitles or something like that. So there's a whole site there telling you how to use subtitling as a technique. And the, the second link there is much more of a practical uh, how-to menu. All right, a couple more suggestions before my time runs out. Um, and this is for using cameras. Um, students, of course, in most countries have mobile phones. And it's very difficult, of course, when they're texting in the class or they're doing things with their cameras. But there are reasons sometimes to encourage the use of mobile phones with cameras in the class. Um, I particularly like the idea of the availability of pictures. Um, I set this activity up by taking some pictures myself. And the examples that I've got here are all from, from Brussels. One from a, a, one's a picture of a, a boarding outside a, a fast food restaurant. One's a tourist bus. Um, uh, another one, you see the 24-hour banking above a, an ATM. And the other one, it actually says City 2, or it's called City 2 Shopping Mall, um, is the main shopping mall in the center of Brussels. And all of these things are in English. So I give the students, uh, I show the students these pictures. Um, hopefully, I can do this through projection, but I could always print them off and, and, and show them like that or uh, project it in some way. I ask them, first of all, uh, to, to translate this language back into their mother tongue. That's the first thing that I do. Um, the second stage of this activity is to ask them to discuss why, um, why they think these things have been put up in English. After all, Brussels is not an English-speaking city. It's a, a French and a Flemish-speaking city. Maybe for the tourist bus, you can understand why it's in English. But why is shopping mall written in English when there's a perfectly good reason, a perfectly good expression in French or Flemish? So we're beginning to explore the way that language is used politically. I mean, you might call this linguistic imperialism even. Um, but this is how I set it up, first of all. I then ask students uh, to do the same. And for homework, and this is slightly original homework, their job is to go around the city with their cameras, with their mobile phone cameras, and take pictures of English that they see, which they then bring back into class. In a city like Brussels, um, it's everywhere. English is just almost everywhere. Uh, but even in cities where you might expect to see a lot less, I don't know, I was in Tbilisi in Georgia earlier in this year, and there was just English absolutely everywhere. Um, everywhere I've been, and I travel a lot, I found quite a bit. And so let's explore it. And we work on the translation. We look at the mistakes in English. And again, we explore why it's in English uh, rather than some other language. So using cameras um, is, is another idea I'd like to suggest. And one final one before I stop um, for more advanced level students is using concordances. Now, concordance is a, is, a, is a piece of software which uh, contains a large database of English. Maybe it's got a few million words. And it enables you to type in a particular word, and it will give you examples of how that word is used in context. Um, the example that I've used here, the, the link is on the site. But if, if you can't get a note of that link, you can go back and watch this uh, recording of the seminar, the webinar later on. So we've got nine examples of this word place. And I'm interested in a word like place because it's such a, a central word um, in English. It's a very, very important word. I take these lines and I ask uh, the students. This is higher level from B2 upwards, I think, is probably about right. I ask them again to translate these into mother tongue. And what they'll see is that they will be translating this word in many, many different ways. So I'm trying to develop their awareness of key words in English um, through translation. It will work the other way, too. Um, one of the translations of uh, place uh, into Spanish would be sitio. sitio. And uh, sitio is used in many different ways, too. So you can, again, take some kind of a concordance version of that word, which you can get by doing Google. Just type sitio into Google, uh, a Spanish version of Google. You get loads of examples, and then get your students to work at translating it back into English. All right. Uh, well, the time is just after 4 o'clock, so I really must uh, stop talking and give you some chance to ask questions, because the questions are coming up far too fast for me to check. Um, the examples that I've given you are only a selection that I could provide. Um, there are two other places that you can go. The first on the left here is a little book that I wrote with Lindsay Clanfield uh, called A Guide to Dictation and Translation. And it's, uh, it's downloadable 
as a little ebook. It's free. It doesn't cost anything at all. And you can get it through the straightforward website, um, dictation and translation together. And on the right is the handout that I wrote earlier this year to accompany this talk. Well, I'll stop there. Um, if anybody would like to ask me anything, I'm quite happy to sit around for a little bit longer. Uh, thank you all very much for attending. Um, I'm very flattered there's been so many people, nearly 400 people coming here. Um, I hope you find it interesting. I hope I've motivated you to try a few things. But if anyone's got some questions, I'll try to answer them as I look at the screen. If not, uh, I wish you a happy Christmas and uh, St. Nicholas's Day for those of you who celebrate that. And if it's not your religion, and it's not mine, I must admit, a happy winter season. All the best. I hope you have a good holiday too. Bye-bye. Any questions for Philip? We've got some raised hands here. Are these questions? Uh, Lily, do you have a question? If so, would you like to pop it in the chat box? Oh, Caroline, I forgot to, to ask you to send off the bibliography. Can we I was just that? going to ask about that. Thank you. I just completely forgot. I apologise to everyone, but the, the bibliography is also on, on the blog anyway, so uh, it doesn't matter too much. Yes, there's a question about assisted translation. You're not to translate every word right. Yes, I do mean that. Don't translate every word. Only, um, only trans, uh, translate a certain number, the sorts of words which your students will be typically looking up in the dictionary. But certainly don't translate uh, any of the structural items, the little grammar words. No, that's the whole point of it. They should be working on them themselves. That was Nina. Thank you, Nina, for that question. We've got a question here. Uh, how do we convince the department heads about using the translation method? How do we convince department heads about using the translation method? Well, um, this is going to be problematic because in, in some institutions because it's a very political issue. And a lot of institutions have, have made, they, they, that's how they sell themselves as an institution. The, the simple fact of the matter is that they are wrong in banning the mother tongue, except perhaps for commercial reasons. I think that the first thing uh, that you should do is you should perhaps ask them if, they, if you can have an in-service uh, departmental meeting about it. If you do a little bit of um, background reading yourself, and the bibliography which you can find either uh, through the handout or on the blog uh, handout is long. It is very, very, very powerful and very convincing. You could, for example, you'll find on the blog some links to some British Council videos. These are very short videos with big names in ELT talking about it. Um, but you've got to start talking about it, and I think you should start talking about it. One way of doing it uh, would perhaps even be to watch uh, collectively as a department some or parts of this uh, recorded webinar. There's also a video version of it which was filmed earlier this year, which you can get through the blog. And you could perhaps watch part of that and then begin discussing it. Um, but I'm sure that there are some department heads who will never be convinced. Um, but there are still some department heads who are convinced uh, that we should be doing grammar translation of the old style. Um, that's the way it is, I'm afraid. There's also a question here about how to go about uh, assessing translation. Yes, I see that. How to assess the translation. I hope well, I ha maybe I've not been clear enough. Um, with most of these activities, I'm not really interested in assessing the translation. We, we could, of course, be talking about translation for uh, assessment purposes, but that's not what I've really been talking about at all. All of, my, all of my interest in all of these activities is not in what is the final product like. It's in the kinds of learning opportunities that are provided in the process of moving towards a translation. If you are interested in translation as, as a tool for evaluation, um, that's a very big and very complicated subject. And I don't think 
um, that I'm personally I'm competent to talk about that. But my interest is really in the processes, the learning processes, the opportunities that are afforded rather than in the, the final translation. Okay, itself. I think we'll um, end that. I'm going to turn off the recording. Um,